Thanks, Dave. Thanks for coming. Good. Actually, I worked on VC libraries. Oh, uh, do you want me to be mic'd? Please. Yes? I did research, I did dev, so I know a little bit of, uh, of everything uh, except uh, you know, marketing and program management and that sort of thing. Um, then I uh, quit Microsoft and started working uh, in open source and uh, worked with uh, Dave Abrahams and Boost Consulting. So does anybody here, everybody here know what Boost is? Anybody not know what Boost is? Anybody not know? You don't know? No. Don't know. Okay. Boost is... You know. Oh, you do know. Okay. For anyone who doesn't know, Boost is an open source repository of C++ code. You can go to boost.org and download code for all sorts of things, smart pointers and image manipulation libraries and uh, text manipulation libraries. And we're going to talk a little bit about those today. Um, so the purpose of the uh, talk is uh, text manipulation utilities that you will find in Boost. Or anything you can do, I can do better. The reason why is uh, C++ has a terrible reputation uh, for text processing. Um, generally, people turn to languages like uh, Perl and Python when they have to manipulate some text. Uh, but we're going to show you uh, ways that you can do all that more in C++. Hopefully. This is what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to become adept string manipulators in C++ using the boost utilities. We're going to learn how to be manipulative, I guess. Um, first, we'll cover some really simple stuff. Um, lexical cache, string algorithm libraries, really basic uh, ad hoc sort of text manipulation tools that are handy in lots of different scenarios. And then we're going to talk about a little bit more interesting stuff. Uh, we're going to take a little uh, diversion, talk a bit about uh, imperative versus declarative programming. And we're going to talk about uh, domain-specific languages. Uh, so if strings and boost don't interest you, you might still get something out of this talk, uh, but probably not much. We'll talk about uh, regular expressions. We'll talk about a library called Spirit, which is a library for uh, building parsers, parser generators and a little bit about a library called Expressive, which is uh, a little bit of, of both of those. And if we have time at the end, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some kind of secret stuff in Boost that they don't want you to know about uh, for handling Unicode. And I will stop promptly at 8, even if I'm in mid-sentence, and you guys can get home. All right, the simple stuff. So. Real simple stuff that you might want to do. This up here, convert a string into an integer. This is Python, by the way, very nice language. It's just that simple. Int of a string, you cast it, and it does the conversion for you. Makes sense. The other way is just as simple. C++, this is the legacy that we get from C. If you want to convert a string to an integer, in C++, you have to call uh, A2I, which is uh, not exactly what I would have thought to look for if I didn't know to look for it. Um, it's a question for you uh, about the interface of A2I. What happens if the string can't be converted to an integer? Does anybody know? It returns zero. It returns zero. Yeah. No error in. What happens if you pass a string zero? What does it return? Zero. Great. Well, so if you get back a zero, did it succeed or did it fail? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you don't either. So there's absolutely no error handling. This is a terrible, terrible interface. Um, and if you want to go the other way, you have I to A, <coughs> pass it an integer, and a buffer. What's this last parameter? Does anybody know? Base. 
Yes, the radix. I tried to fool you. I guess I could. Okay. So it is not the buffer size. If you pass in a buffer that is too small, you're screwed. There is no error handling here either. And the interface is complicated. You know, you have to declare a buffer someplace else. You can't just use it in place. And um, does anybody know one other thing that's wrong with with this function? Can anybody spot it? Sorry, can you not see? Do I need to move this stuff? All right. Anything else wrong? Buffer length management. Buffer length management? Well, yeah, we mentioned that one already. We had to talk about unit build, but I don't know if that's what you're thinking about. No, no. It is not actually standard. <coughs> yep. This function doesn't exist in this manual. You can't actually call it in a portable room. Oops. <laughs> there is actually some code in the standard that will let you do this in a portable way. It's called string stream. Did anybody, did anybody actually know string stream? Know it exists? Okay, wow, surprised. So what you can do is you can declare a string stream, you can write stuff into it, and read it back out again. And it will do the conversions for you. So you write in an integer, you read out a string. You've converted an integer to a string. You can go the other way, too. You write in a string and read out an integer. Okay. That seems pretty nice, but it's not as simple as in Python, where you just cast it from one to the other. But if you notice, these two blocks of code are really similar. You declare a string stream, you declare what your, your two variable is, you stream some data in, and you stream that data out. So let's turn it into a function and call it lexical cast. This is pretty much the entire lexical cast library. And this guy with the cool hair is the guy who wrote it, Kevin, Kevlin. So what we do is we declare our string stream and our result, which needs to be default constructed. We stream our argument in. We stream it out into our result. We check the stream state. This will evaluate to false if either of those operations fail. And we'll throw an exception if it failed. Otherwise, we return our result. So we know whether it failed, which is actually kind of nice. You like to know when your operations fail. Here's how you use it. You just cast, you pass something in, you cast it to what you want it to be, and that's it. You're done. The other way it works too. So here we have a, a clean interface. We actually have error reporting, which is nice. And it's extensible, because all you have to do to make one of your types lexical castable is write a uh, OStream inserter and an extractor. It's not all uh, roses, though. Uh, lexical cast is a terrible name. Um, the performance kind of sucks, because you need to dynamically allocate a string for whatever, convert everything into a text representation, and then convert it into whatever, you know, you have this text intermediate. And also, uh, there's no internationalization. Right? So you can't say, I'm going to convert it to, this, I'm going to read this string in, and it's a German string, German integer, so it uses commas instead of periods. But, on the whole, it's a whole lot better than I to A and A to I. OK, that was nice, but not all that interesting. String Algo is actually a really, really useful library. And most of what you would want to fire up uh, the Python or the Perl interpreter to do, you can get done with string algorithms. There are algorithms in here for uh, trimming spaces off of strings, uh, for doing case conversions, uh, finding and replacing strings, and slicing and dicing them, and that sort of thing. Um, it's a really big library. We're not going to talk about all that you can do, but we'll talk about some of them and some of the conventions. So 
here's an example of using string algorithms. Just include the string algorithm header up there. And now we declare a string, we initialize it, and now we have these string algorithms appropriately named to upper. And this will mutate the string in place. So it's really efficient. If you have a string and you want to mutate it in place, to upper or trim will chop the spaces off of it. And this one down here will create a new string. So something to know about the string algorithm library is there are some conventions here. Every algorithm comes in two variants, the regular and one that has a copy on the end there. So there's a two upper copy which will not mutate in place, but create a copy and return it. Uh, people here familiar with the standard template library and the standard algorithms? No, they, they work on iterators, right? No iterators here. This is a range-based interface. You pass it a range of characters, it will either mutate that range in place, or it will return a new range from it range being a string or perhaps a vector of characters or what have you. The nice thing about it is that it lets you stack your algorithms like this. I'm going to call one algorithm. I'm going to use its return value immediately and call another algorithm with just, which mutates the string further. That means these algorithms are composable. You can express a lot in just a little line of code. Yeah, question. So there's an extra copy, I mean, you've got two copy operations there. Is there any optimization out of that extra copy? No, no optimization. What you could have done instead, you could have, uh, you could have used the mutating algorithms instead, mm -hmm. because two upper will return a reference to stir one. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you could have, you could have stacked your your in place mutation algorithms that way. Yeah. What, how does it work when you're concatenating a, a string? Like in the case of hello, goodbye, do, are there in place ones for that? For concatenation? Right. Like in, that, in, in the case there, you're replacing hello with goodbye. It's obviously longer. Does uh, really right. No, I don't think it does anything like that. No. Is there another question over there? Does this work just on ASCII? No, there are, uh, the question was, does it work on ASCII? Uh, no, it works on uh, wide characters also. Yeah. And does it, uh, I, like for different languages, like capitalization is very different? Localization, right. So that's a very good question. A lot of these algorithms uh, take an optional extra parameter, which is a std locale, which it will use to do any uh, uh, locale sensitive uh, case comparisons or case conversions and that sort of thing. Uh, which uh, is another good point. This, this I here. What this means is case insensitive. A lot of algorithms have an I variant. There is a replace first and there's an I replace first. The I replace first ignores case. I'm not going to go through all the algorithms that are there, but uh, if you're interested in this, uh, then definitely go check out the documentation for the string algorithms library on boost.org. Um, here is one example that I will show you, though, the split algorithm. I really miss this in C++. This is one of the handiest things in Perl. Um, splitting a string, tokenizing it, and doing all sorts of slicing and dicing operations. Uh, this is really handy for it. So you'll notice uh, this classification here. So we have an input string, stir. We have uh, a vector of strings. This is going to receive our tokens after we split our string up. And we call the split algorithm. And we pass it this sort of predicate looking thing here, is any of. So it uses those characters as a delimiter. And it will split the string up using those characters as a delimiter. And uh, the string algorithm library has lots of different classifications that you can use. Is space, is upper, do what you would expect. Is from range A through Z, could be handy. There's a little, uh, something interesting going on here. Is lnum or is pumped? So what's happening here is like these classification objects 
are being combined into a larger composite object. This operator is overloaded. So what happens is, you know, if you were to take this and stick it in there, this expression is creating some large composite lambda object, which is your predicate. And that predicate will be used as your classification to find your delimiters. Yeah, question? Uh, how is split different than boost tokenizer? A lot easier to use. Uh, I'm not actually familiar with boost, boost tokenizer, uh, except for the fact that uh, a lot of people seem to complain about the complexity of using it. Um, I don't know, does anybody here actually have experience using boost tokenizer? Yeah? Yeah. So you have to construct, you, you have to tell what type of delimiter you're using. And I like it because it produces a, a you can iterate the, the tokens rather than having to put them on a vector like that. Yes. Okay. You yeah. copy. I, that's a good point. So uh, you might think that uh, this is needlessly expensive because you, uh, you split the string all at once and you have to allocate a bunch of small string objects. But if that had been, say, like a stood pair of iterators, then uh, instead of creating new strings as your tokens, you would have iterator pairs pointing into your original string. And so it would be very efficient. You wouldn't be constantly allocating more and more strings. Not quite as efficient as what you were saying with the, uh, with the tokenizer library, where you're stepping through your, your tokens one at a time. Any other questions about this? No? OK. So that's it for the real simple stuff. Um, there are other really simple libraries in Boost for, for doing text manipulation, like, uh, like Format. And I encourage you guys to explore on your own, but we're not going to get to that one in this talk. So we're going to talk a little bit about structured text manipulation. And, and I'll, I'll say a few words beforehand about uh, some topics that are near and dear to my heart, um, domain-specific languages, um, and declarative programming. Uh, this is a, a drum I really like to beat a lot, and I'm sorry if uh, some of you have heard me talk about it before. Um, I, I stole a few slides from an earlier presentation. Sorry. So then we'll talk about uh, manipulating text dynamically, and we'll talk about generating parsers statically with spirit, and say uh, just a few words about Expressive, which uh, is like a hybrid, it does a little bit of both. So, if you remember from uh, your grammar, English grammar classes, there's an imperative sentence which expresses a command or request, such as set the television on fire. It's an instruction, a command. And there are declarative sentences which just uh, say something about the state of the world, which is like the television is on fire. Not a command. And in CS101, you probably learned about imperative programming and declarative programming. These are two different programming paradigms. Um, imperative means uh, you're going to tell the computer step by step what to do. First do this, then do that. Talking about how to mutate your program's state. Declarative programming is nothing like that at all. You talk about, you tell the computer what you want it to compute, and it figures out how to compute it. You don't tell it how. So there's no really no worrying about the program state in declarative programming. You're probably not as familiar with declarative programming as you are with imperative. C++ is mostly an imperative programming language. Actually, it's a, it's a multi-paradigm programming language. You can do declarative programming in it, and we'll see how. Here's an example. Find and print an email subject. Get some text, compare some magic numbers in here for like how much you want to compare, then another magic number, and forget about you know chop off any you know reads you know regarding that's not interesting to your subject right okay, and then output the subject line. This is imperative. Do this, then do that. Here's another way of doing the same thing. You declare a regular expression. Find subject optionally, you know, regarding, and then the rest of your subject. 
read the line in, match it, and then rip out the part that we were interested in, the part that was in parentheses. This is regex syntax, and we're going to talk a little bit about this later. Don't sweat the details now. Imperative and declarative. Two different ways of doing the same thing. Imperative describes the algorithm. Declarative describes the goal. This is what I'm looking for. Just do it. Don't worry me with the details. This is kind of verbose. That's concise. That would be really hard to maintain and extend. That one would be easy to maintain and extend. Okay. So here's a question for you. If declarative is so wonderful, why are most popular programming languages imperative? Anyone? Question? Composability? What was that? Composability? Composability, what do you mean? Uh, simplicity of being able to add new things on, I think. it's. I don't think it's any harder, really, but I think people tend to think more imperatively. OK, that it seems to jive more with the way people think. Yeah? That's what I was going to say. People can think easily in terms of first do this, then do this, then do that, and they understand how it works. Whereas declarative means, here's what the solution is like, go figure it out. I, think it's, I don't know if it's fear or what, but I, I want to trust the computer to figure out how to do it. OK, that's true, definitely. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah? You can't do I.O. You can't do I.O. I think you're thinking of functional programming. Functional programming is really hard to do I.O. Declarative programming, I don't know. Is it for this and then for this? Yeah, that's true. OK. So, so for I.O., you definitely need a sequence <coughs> of, of statements. True. Good point. And I.O. also uh, inherently deals with state. I.O. is very stateful. Yeah, OK. True. This is a question. Can you, is there, can you make a an, an, an declarative language that's Turing complete? Can you do everything that there is to be done? Yes, Prolog. Prolog is a, is a declarative, well, it's, 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 it's an inference engine. And you write your programs by declaring you know, the things that you want it to compute. And it figures out, it infers the order in which to uh, execute them. Well, I know it's Turing complete, but most of those declarative things can only are custom built for a very small subset of problems, you think? Exactly. They are very domain specific. We're going to talk about that. Thanks. Like, you can't use regular expressions to do general, like, parsing of, or recursive descent parsing. Oh, Just God, no. Yeah. <laughs> Though, that doesn't stop people from trying. <laughs> that, that's kind of what I was going to say. When you, you know, historically, you start from assembly programming and work up. And when you work up to a general purpose programming language, it winds up assembly programming is going to be imperative. So yes. when you evolve up from that, it's going to be imperative. And the, the cases that we have that are really good declarative languages, they're domain specific. They're, they're make, they're SQL, they're, they're regex. Bingo. Yes, we're getting to it now. So declarative programming is really great when there's only one way to do something, right? You're telling the computer, I want you to calculate this. If there's only one way to calculate it, I, don't, I shouldn't have to tell the computer how to do it, right? It should just know. And that's only true, generally speaking, in very narrow domains. So for instance, regular expressions. There's really one best way to match a regular expression, and that's by building a finite state machine. I shouldn't have to tell the computer, OK, here's how you build a finite state machine. Right? I just say, match this regular expression, and it'll go off and do it. But that's not true in general. General programming languages, you have to be able to solve any sort of problem, and you're going to have to tell the computer how to do it. So, that's why, in general, programming languages are imperative, except very domain-specific programming languages, which can be declarative. But we can have the best of both by embedding our domain-specific languages in our imperative languages. Think about Perl. Perl is an imperative programming language, but you can do regular expressions in Perl very easily. Some other examples, Ruby on Rails is very declarative. The JUnit test for, uh, framework in Java also is declarative, but Java is imperative. And regex. So now we're going to talk a little bit about boost regex 
Yeah. General question about, about DSLs. I've often found in practice it's, it's difficult to distinguish between a, kind of a small domain specific language and just a nice interface that I've designed that's sort of, you know, got a couple of nice operator overloads or something. Is there, yeah. is there a line or is it just entirely fuzzy? It's entirely fuzzy and it's up to you. I mean, if you choose to think of it as a nice interface, then that works. You can choose to think of it as a domain specific language and that works too. Like in the string algorithms example. You saw how we had those um, those predicates that we could combine with the, that, that overloaded uh, OR operator. You can think of that as a really simple, very simple, domain-specific language for creating predicates, composite predicates. It's also a really nice interface. So that, that's John Maddock. He wrote it. It's accepted in TR1. It's going to be in the next version of C++ standard. Yay, finally. And it's got really useful constructs for uh, matching and searching, replacing, and even tokenizing. So we're going to learn all sorts of different ways to tokenize strings. It's an example of what I would call a dynamic domain-specific embedded language in, in C++. By dynamic, I mean that you can specify new statements at runtime. If I made a text editor that accepted regular expressions from the user, that's okay. I could use boost regex for that because it will process these regular expression strings and interpret them at runtime. The nice thing about that is that uh, your domain-specific language has uh, freeform syntax. Anything that you can put in quotes can be a domain-specific language. So for instance, if you wanted to embed a, a SQL statement, you know, select star from table, blah, 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 right? You put it in, in quotes. That is a domain-specific language for doing relational database queries. And like we saw already, regular expressions also. I'm not going to belabor this too much. These are uh, some special meta characters, regular expression syntax. Anyone who's done Perl programming is probably familiar with this already, and it's not really all that interesting to us right now. The algorithms uh, that come with uh, Boost Regex, uh, first and most important is uh, Regex Match. That will take a pre-compiled regular expression and check to see whether it matches a string. And the whole string has to match. So for instance, we can write a regular expression that matches a social security number and ask someone to enter their social security number, maybe on some phishing website that we've designed. <laughs> uh, and check to see whether they've, uh, they've entered their social security number correctly, because you really want the correct social security number when you're designing a phishing website. And you'll tell them, OK, uh, that wasn't a, a valid regex, uh, a valid social security number, enter it again. Regex search is like regex match, except the whole stream doesn't have to match. Right? The regex doesn't have to consume the entire input string. It'll scan through the string and find matches. So for instance, uh, if you were a spammer and you wanted to uh, you know, scrape uh, email addresses off the web, you wanted to harvest the email addresses, you might, like, uh, you might write a regex like this. Matches, you know, a href equals mail to, aha, this is the good stuff, right? Email address, I want to spam. And then you search an HTML page and find instances of it. And then, you know, write out all the email addresses that you've harvested. Regex replace does exactly what you would expect it to. It uh, finds things that match your regex, replaces them with some substitution string that you specify. This is a really lame example, but you know, not a very interesting <coughs> regular expression, find a space. Right? You could probably use the string algo, the string algo library for this. It'd be probably a lot better. But OK. If you wanted to process, uh, you know, do some, some URL escaping, for instance, that's the example here, replace spaces with percent %20s in your URL. Regex iterator, as I mentioned, uh, regex search will scan your input until it finds a match. Regex iterator is 
what if I want to step through all of the matches in a string, one at a time? So you declare a regex iterator, and you pass it the begin and end iterators of the, uh, the HTML page that you want to search, and your regular expression. And then you just step through them. You know, this is, this is an iterator. You increment the iterator, and it finds the next instance that matches the regex. It will scan for you. Right? So this loop will iterate over all of the found email addresses on your HTML page. No, it does not iterate forever. It will finish when begin equals end. Your particular example. End here is uninitialized. It's a special case. When you, you default construct one of these regex iterators, that is the end iterator. Little wonky. But this follows a, a pattern set in the standard library. For instance, if you've used an OStream iterator, OStream iterators behave the exact same way. But nobody really uses OStream iterators. What? Yeah, you do? I do. Excellent. Well done. <laughs> I do, I don't. So you'll notice that if you dereference one of these uh, regex iterators, you'll get back a, uh, a match, match results object. This contains all sorts of information about what matched, including the back references. So like what one matches the first capture, where parentheses are numbered from left to right. So this is your first group, that's your, that will report what matched. Okay. And zero is the whole thing. Zero is the whole thing, yeah. That, we got that from Perl, we can't help it. Okay, regex token iterator is a lot like regex iterator. The only difference being when you when you dereference the regex token iterator, you get back the string that matched instead of the match result, which can be a lot more useful. It's also very uh, configurable. Um, so if this last parameter here, one, that one is the same as this one. So it will tell you which reference in the results to pull out and make that the string. Whoops. Right. So oh, I guess I, I do actually use those string iterators. I'm using one right here. <laughs> <laughs> so you create your token iterator, and then you copy from begin to end. You write all of your strings to output. Or if you like using the boost lambda library, which I'm not going to talk about, you could just say, use a lambda expression. This looks really magical if you've never seen lambda, and I'm not going to bother explaining it. But believe me, this, this actually works. Okay. So here is a regular expression challenge. People here uh, write regular expressions? Anybody? Yeah? A few people? Okay. Can this be done? Can you write a regex to match balanced nested braces? No, no, it's not a regular language. It's not. It's not regular. Right. What happens if you try? Right. You so I'm going to match it, match a brace and a bunch of things that aren't braces, and then a closing brace. That won't match because we have uh, you know a nest, a nested brace here. So that's not quite. How about this one? No, not yet. This will actually match that. It does. This matches braces nested once. Right? But if this had two levels of nesting, then this wouldn't match. And we'd have to we'd have to write another one. That matches three. 
but we're not there yet. So we would need to write a regex that goes on and on and on forever in order to match arbitrarily nested balanced parentheses. Can you backtrack? Hmm? Can you backtrack or have a back reference? It's not going to help you. It's still, it's still not recursive, which is what you need. Yeah. By Perl 6. Ah, Perl 6 is different. They're fixing this problem in Perl 6. Yeah. But that is not regular expressions. They will call it regular expressions, but it is not. <laughs> They're just redefining what regular expressions are at that point. Right, exactly. So regu a regular language uh, cannot match, cannot solve this problem. People try to make regular expressions solve this problem all the time. And they get it wrong. I love this quote. <laughs> You need the right tool for the job, and for a lot of jobs, regular expressions just are not it. That brings us to Spirit. Spirit is the tool that you would want to use to find matched, matching balanced nested parentheses. Right? Because you can use Spirit to write a grammar that is recursive, which is the tool that you need to do this. That's Joel de Guzman. He is the author of Spirit. So it's a, it's a parser generator, uh, a, lot, a lot like a Lex and Yak, or Flex and Bison, if you're familiar with those guys. Like pairs, both levels, parser and Lexer? Yeah. Flex and Bison is Lex and Yak. Flex yeah. and Bison, I think, are the, the GNU. Yeah, but my question is that Spirit covers ah. both of those levels. Spirit is both of those levels, yeah. It's actually a... a Lexer and uh, parser generator all in one. And we talked about domain specific uh, languages before. This is another one, but it's a totally different take on embedding a domain specific language in C. So regex is your domain specific language was in quotes. It was a string, it was dynamic, you could specify it at runtime. In spirit, it's not, it's an expression template. You build up an expression using operator overloads, and at compile time, that gets transformed into a parser generator that generates machine code and is immediately executable. There's no interpreter there at all. I'll show you what I mean, because it's probably a little confusing if you've ever seen it before. Right, I just said this. Okay. The nice thing about doing uh, a domain-specific embedded language this way, as opposed to the regex way, is that it's syntax ch checked by the compiler. So what happens if, uh, in, in regular expressions, you uh, include a malformed regex in, your, in quotes? That error is not going to be detected until runtime. It'll generate a runtime exception. That error can't happen uh, with spirit. Instead, what you'll get is a terrible compile time error. <laughs> but it's compile time, which is better. Yes? So what you're saying is that the, the grammar specification is what syntax checked uh, and, uh, yes, and the grammar. not the language itself that it's the grammar for. Correct. Right. Correct. Yes. The idea is also that um, you should be able to get better performance because you don't have to interpret it at runtime. You can generate machine code for it at compile time. And the other thing is that uh, we'll see an example of this. Full access to types and data in your program. That will become clear later. So if you've taken uh, compilers in school, a compilers class, CS, whatever, you probably saw a Bacchus Nauer form and uh, using uh, this uh, formulation to express grammars. This is a grammar for an infix calculator. So we've got uh, you know parenthesized expressions. Uh, we've got integers. Right? This group here refers to that group there. This expression here refers to that expression there. So you can see uh, group, group, factor, factor, term, term, expression. So the whole thing is is recursive, recursively defined. <coughs> and this captures what it means to be an algebraic expression. 
we've got multiplication and division and plus and minus. And the way these rules relate to each other captures not just the syntax, but also the semantics and the operator precedence. By the way these rules relate, multiplication binds more tightly than addition, which is how we want it. This is how we would do it in spirit. Did you guys catch that? Want to do it again? <laughs> This is executable C++ code. And it means exactly what you would think it means. This is the grammar, a spirit, an executable C++ grammar that matches algebraic expressions. So what happened? This guy in EBNF means uh, zero or more. C++ doesn't have a postfix star operator. But it's got a prefix star operator. All right, so we use that instead. And you can't just put a, uh, a character next to, you know, a variable. You need some operator there. So Spirit uses this sequencing operator, just because something has to be there. This guy doesn't change at all. And really, that's that's pretty much it. You know, and our, we use assignment here instead of uh, this wonky EBNF form because that's not a valid C++ operator. So this is an example of a static domain-specific embedded language in C++. This is what I mean. We have told the compiler, and we fix this at compile time. Like this is what it means to match an algebraic expression. These are the spirit parser primitives. I won't trouble you with them. You can learn about you can learn about uh, this stuff on your own by reading Spirit's docs, which are very good by the way. Here are the spirit parser operators. So we saw that uh, this guy means match x followed by y. That guy means match x or y. We can complement a character here. We can do uh, parser difference, match x but not y. Uh, this is zero or more. These are probably familiar from regex, right? Zero or more, one or more. This makes it optional. This is kind of like the regex question mark. You know. This one's real interesting. When you put an action, this is like a uh, uh, like a predicate, like an STL predicate or a function or something like that. Call this function whenever this matches. This is really useful and very neat, very powerful. We'll see why. This is a complete executable program. You can copy and paste this into a, you know, an IDE, hit compile, and, and run. This, this executes. Here's our calculator, defined just as we saw. And now we can assert by calling the spirit parse function that this is a real algebraic expression that conforms to our grammar, and this one is not. The spirit parse function will return, mm, right, returns a parse info structure, which tells you all sorts of information about what matched where. And it has a, a member called full, which tells you, OK, I matched the full string. So. Yes, this matches the full string. No, that does not. Any questions about this? This is a bit of a mind bender, I know. No? OK. OK, semantic actions. If you want to build, say, for instance, a calculator that actually calculates, then you would need to use some semantic actions. So here's a simple example. Here's our parser. 
match a curly brace, followed by a bunch of alphanumeric characters, followed by a closing curly brace. And if this part succeeds, call this function. Right, we'll take two iterators. The begin iterator of the part that matched, and the end iterator of the part that matched. So this will print high. Some of the parsers that Spirit provides, like int p, will do a little bit of extra processing for you. So it will match characters that represent an integer. It will convert those characters to an integer for you. And then it will call your semantic action with an integer, which is a lot more helpful than two char stars. So you don't have to do the conversion yourself. So the, the signature and the arguments of that semantic action uh, functor is going to depend on what you're appending. It depends on what you've attached it to, yeah. Parsers are saying, do you have return values? Uh, the return value of a parser is what will be passed to the action you attach to it. So in this case, int p is documented to return an integer. You could use the Lambda library for this as well. Right. Now I don't have to write a separate function. I could just say, you know, write the argument to C out. Magic, again, I'm not going to get into it. OK. So which is a pro? Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. If you don't include uh, one of the functors, what does the output of the parse look like? like how oh, if, if you don't attach any semantic actions? Yeah. Then you get back that parse info struct that we saw, which will tell the parse info struct, which uh, will tell you, like, the match started here and it ended there and it consumed the whole input or it didn't, and information like that, how many characters were matched all total. So just, just a structure, it'll return. Which you still get if you define the, you, know, you get that anyhow, right? Yeah, you'll get that in here. That's true. <laughs> Any other questions about that? I think that's all I, I really want to say about Spirit. And obviously, there's there's a lot, a lot that I didn't cover in Spirit, like creating grammars and uh, specifying skip parsers. So, for instance, uh, if you want like white space is is not significant for my grammar, there is a way to tell Spirit that white space is not significant, and it'll skip over whatever you specify is, is unimportant. Um, a lot of other really neat things. Um, definitely check it out if you're at all interested in building a parser in C++. Yeah? How does it compare performance-wise with uh, uh, the classical, you know? Like Lex and Yak? Yeah. Terribly, unfortunately. Um, really? Yeah, uh, Spirit, um, unfortunately, was not designed with performance in mind. Uh, and so a lot of people have complained about uh, Spirit's performance, which is really unfortunate because it could be extremely fast. Um, and actually, uh, Joel and I are working on Spirit 2, and the entire purpose of the rewrite is to fix the performance problems. Will the, will the interface be the same and just fix the, fix the implementation? Or the interface will be a, very similar. <laughs> it, there will be some breaking interface changes. But uh, it, it will look and feel an awful lot like Spirit 1. I guess how do you plan to fix the speed problems? So what's, what's your approach? Um, the, uh, what's the approach? This is the question to fixing the speed problems. Uh, a lot of the, um, the Spirit does an awful lot for you, more than you ask it to in a lot of cases. Uh, so, I mean, you'd like to be able to have the features there but only pay for them when you use them, which is not actually how Spirit was designed. Unfortunately, there is a lot that you pay for even if you don't use it. So for instance, uh, parse should return a bool. Right? All the parse functions recursively, uh, that Spirit makes, you know, all the calls that it makes to itself 
right? All those functions should just return a simple bool yes acid match no identity. Instead, it, match, it returns this structure. It's like it matched from here to here. It matched this many characters. And it has to compute that all along as it goes. And it's just a very uh, inefficient way of, of doing it. So we're out with all of that, that gag. I'm going to implement it uh, very uh, lean and mean, and uh, it's such that you have to ask when you need more information. How's the timeline look on that project? We're hoping to have Spirit 2 done by May. And, and there's a reason why, and I'll, I'll get to that, what's happening in May. <coughs> Surprise. Any other questions? Is there an easy way to export this uh, from C to uh, GAC? Oh, is there like a, is there a conversion from, from Spirit to GAC? No, no, no not, not really. And, and, and going the other way uh, is a little tricky as well. Like if you have a, a yak grammar and you want to import it into Spirit, um, that's actually a tricky thing to do, um, having to do with something called left recursion, which uh, is it's it's more than I really want to get into at the moment. But a lot of times you will need to rewrite your your grammar in order to get Spirit to accept it. The docs will will tell you all about. It the left recursion problem and groups that you have to jump through if your grammar has left recursion. Yeah? Is it another one more, sir? Or is it another one? Uh, uh, it's recursive descent, right? It is, it's recursive descent, yeah. But um, it, it doesn't depend on matching left back. No, it does not. Right. Yeah. That's actually a good question, though. I don't really know. Any other questions? I'm pretty sure it's L A L R one. Look ahead one, yeah. Because it just looks ahead one, and yeah. then, you know, because that's the way it, it composes the parsing. I think there are extensions to Spirit where you can look ahead more than just one, but uh, it doesn't do that by default. You have to use like some special construct. Anyway, so some differences between regex and Spirit. If you're if you want to choose one tool over the other. Uh, you can use um, both for ad hoc pattern matching, um, but only Spirit will match uh, recursive context-free grammars. They can both be used for manipulating text, uh, but only Spirit will let you manipulate your program state by attaching semantic actions that, uh, you know, that do stuff to your program. Only regex will accept new statements at runtime. The nature of Spirit's domain-specific embedded language means that you compile it, and then that's it. You're done. You don't get to specify a new grammar at runtime. Um, exhaustive backtracking semantics, um, regular expressions have this neat property where they will keep trying to match a pattern. And it'll try every possible way. You know, this, uh, these quantifiers match it five times. And if that doesn't work, then try matching it only four times and try again. And it'll try that until it's exhausted every possibility. Spirit doesn't do anything like that. If you say, you know, match a character zero or more times, it will match every character in your input and then say, ah, it didn't work out, I give up, and then fail. So sometimes you want one, sometimes you want the other. It's helpful to know that Spirit does not do exhaustive backtracking like a regular expression engine does. I'm going to look really briefly, just a few slides here, at this new library in uh, the next version of Boost called Expressive. Um, and, and no picture of the author here because you're looking at a library. Um, it is both a static domain-specific embedded language and a dynamic one. So it's both. And it's a regular expression engine, but it can also be used to match uh, recursive regular expressions. So, for instance, you would be able to match balanced nested braces. So, technically, not a regular expression engine. But I call it that anyway. So here's an example. I can compile this string into a regular expression. Or, I can use this spirit-like syntax 
to express the exact same regular expression. That's dynamic. That's static. They are both the exact same regular expression. <coughs> the difference being, this one will execute faster. Because you're giving more information to the compiler. So the idea is you want to be able to write your regular expressions statically when you can, and dynamically when you need to accept them at runtime from the user, or from config files, that sort of thing. You can mix and match static and dynamic together in the same expression. So for instance, get a pattern from the user at runtime, read it into a string. Compile that string as a regular expression, assign it into this variable pattern. And now I'm going to use pattern to create a new regular expression by embedding it, wrapping it with like begin word, end word assertions. This might be useful, for instance, if you were writing a text editor with a regex find feature. You have like a little checkbox that says, you know, whole word only. Right? You'd use that. This is how you might implement it using expressive. So you take user input, parse it as a regular expression, and then it can wrap it in begin word and word assertions. And this guy will get invoked recursively. Not recursively, sorry. That's right, you're assigning it back into the path. So this does not create a cycle, but it will execute the way you think it does. If you want to create a cycle, there is there's a by ref function. So here is how you would solve the braces problem that we saw earlier using expressive. Say, you know, this not brace is you know, create a set that has the two brace characters and complement it. This matches any one character that isn't a brace. And now match stuff that isn't braces or recursively a balanced set of braces. Kind of have to look at it sideways to see that. Yeah, okay. So this is how it all stacks up. Expressive, the new column here, gives you an awful lot of what you might want to use both regex and spirit for. It kind of straddles them both. Uh, with the exception being um, Expressive doesn't have semantic actions yet. And a new row here for in TR1, like you can expect it to be in the standard. Yes, regex, no spirit, no expressive. So that's all I got for Expressive. Is there any questions about that? We have a little bit of extra time, so I am, ooh, it's 8 o'clock. <laughs> ah, so I can either talk about the super secret stuff that's in uh, Boost for handling Unicode, it's only a couple slides, or we can stop now. Super secret, super secret stuff? Okay. Why isn't there a Boost Unicode library? I wish there was one. Nobody stepped up to write it. Any volunteers? Please. <laughs> There is a UTF-8 conversion facet buried in a detailed directory in Boost. It's been in the past couple of uh, Boost releases. You can use it, it's there, but uh, don't expect any support if it goes wrong. I'll show you uh, where it is and how to, how to get at it. Here, for instance, is a complete program that uses uh, the boost UTF-8 facet to read <laughs> a UTF-8 file and convert it into WHR, UCS4, whatever, <coughs> UTF-32. We have to define a bunch of ugly preprocessor macros first. <laughs> and then we include this stuff from detail Boost detail directory. We even have to include a CPP file from the libs directory. Really, really, uh, don't try this at home. Um, 
And now imagine we, we type these wonky characters into Notepad and, and click the uh, Save as UTF-8 option. So that file is not going to have three bytes. It's going to have seven or eight, including the UTF-8 byte order mark character in the beginning. So this is definitely not going to be saved as you know, ASCII. So if we've done this special dance up here, now what we can do, well this, this is bad code and this is good code. If we don't use the UTF-8 conversion facet, we'll open the stream, we will read the characters in, pretending that they're wide characters, and try to assert that we got what we expect. This will fail. We will not get what we expect because we haven't told the stream that we're reading UTF-8. Instead, what we do is we reopen that file, we imbue the stream with a new locale. We create the locale by creating a default locale. This is the global locale. And passing it a new UTF-8 code conversion facet. This is the magic incantation that you need for creating a new locale with a new code conversion facet. And we imbue our final stream with this locale. Now we can read our Unicode from that stream. And this works. Success. You can type this in, copy and paste it, and execute it, and it works. Honest and true. But like I said, that is really, really dirty. That's, that's the best that Boost has to offer for, for Unicode support, I'm sorry to say. So I made some allusion to what's happening in May. May is the Boost conference, very first one. Very exciting. I think I got the URL right, but the Wi-Fi was down in the cafe I was sitting in this morning, so I couldn't check it. Um, Boostcon.org. Check it out. Uh, it's going to be in May. It's going to be in Aspen. So you want to get your uh, company to send you there. Uh, and I, I hope to see you guys there. And uh, we hope to be debuting uh, Spirit 2 at the Boost Conference. Any, uh, any news on when the next Boost is coming out? <laughs> Expressive is still, I mean, you, can, you know, you can enlist in the, in the sandbox, but uh, it's been well over a year since. Uh, yeah, uh, Expressive got accepted into Boost uh, over a year ago. And we haven't had a new release. Yeah, there's been no new release. Yeah. Gills um, in. There's, there's been quite a few interesting libraries. Yeah, much. Added. Uh, my other library, for each, is uh, is in the same state. I wrote that code like five years ago. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, uh, we're working on it. Um, we're getting asymptotically closer. <laughs> You know, asymptote never actually. <laughs> oh, we, we we actually have a hard cutoff of I think March seventh, at which point any bugs that haven't been fixed will be marked as um, bug fixed, and then we're going to have a release candidate and just ship it. Yeah. That's the plan. Uh, I recently read a book. Uh, the C++ standard library extensions, it's all about TR1, mm. about some subsets of TR1, and, and specifically, and I forgot the author, I'm sorry, uh, that I, I found useful, but looked like it was kind of rushed out. It was, it was, there were bugs in, it, mm. in the book. I'm not familiar with the book that you're uh, referring to. It's not the, uh, the book about Boost, is it? No, not Cross about Boost, Boost. that's oh. a different one. Yes. It's the one about TR1. Huh. What's in TR1 and what isn't? And uh, it, there's a, a, a long section in it about the regex uh, library in TR1. Really? I found it interesting, but not ready for prime time as a book. Wow. No, I, I don't know the book you're talking about. I've got the book to the friend who wrote it. Somebody whose name I recognize. Like, you know, like, 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 yeah. Yeah, he, he writes a lot in the, in the next. Is that right, Pete Becker? 
Denver. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I think so. Oh, okay, Dinkum, I think so. Right? Yeah, Dinkum Ware. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. used to work for Dinkum Ware. Yeah. 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 I, I, don't, I don't think it's a Dinkum book. No, no. no, no, no Formerly for Dinkum Ware. Right, wrote the user's journal, and I thought yeah. he worked for Dinkum Ware for a while. I think that's the one. Anyway, it's real interesting, but I hope he keeps working on it and gets it right next time. <laughs> yeah.